G'day mate, 40 here. We're such a swell group of people. I mean, we're not truly superior men. We're not truly the ultimate group. All right. So the keen intellects on this channel, the, the wisdom, the profundity. I mean, think about how far ahead of the game we are. I mean, this is going to be a self-esteem, group esteem enhancing live stream. Celebration of my own channel is that uh, today I was reading the New Yorker. He said that uh, that great much hyped problem of misinformation is misinformation. All right, the problem of misinformation is misinformation because like I'm always saying, our quote-unquote problems are rarely actually our problems. Our problems are just symptoms of deeper problems. Misinformation is not the problem. Misinformation is just a symptom of a deeper problem. So this New, New Yorker article makes the point that people hold two types of beliefs. And I think this is a useful way to categorize things, all right? People hold beliefs right, about facts, right? And so people also hold beliefs about symbols. And so these are two different types of beliefs. So most of our symbolic beliefs are about signaling allegiance to a group, to a particular type of identity. And uh, so people can believe in a flat earth. People can believe that the uh, 1969 moon landing was a hoax. Uh, people can believe that uh, God communicated his will most clearly in some plates that were discovered in I think 19th century America that led to the Latter-day Saints Church. Right? People can have any variety of religious beliefs, conspiracy theory beliefs, they can be wrong about matters of geology and geography and biology. They can deny the truth of evolution and yet be high functioning, you know, successful people because these are symbolic beliefs. When people deny the moon landing, right, they, they're, they're not uh, leading lives that are that dramatically different from people who accept the, the moon landing. So people don't hold to their symbolic beliefs in the same way that they believe, hold to their factual beliefs. So if you're a normal employee, you, you factually know that uh, the more aligned you are with what your bosses and supervisors want you to do, right, the more likely you are to succeed at your work, be appreciated at your work and uh, keep your job and be rewarded and place yourself in a position for you know, good things. On the other hand, you know, factually, the, the less you think about your boss or your superiors and what they want, right, the more likely you are to get out of alignment with them and to run into trouble at work and even possibly lose your job. Right? If you never think about what your spouse wants, right, you're not gonna be married for long. If you never think about what your friends want, uh, you're not gonna keep them as friends. If you don't think about what your family members want, right, you're not gonna have good relations with, with family members. So these are like factual beliefs. You, you believe that uh, in gravity, so you don't step out of a third story window. And these are very different from symbolic beliefs such as religious beliefs or beliefs in conspiracy theories, right? So people who believe that the 2020 election was fixed or people believe that uh, COVID vaccines are more harmful than good, uh, people who deny the truth of evolution, right? They essentially still are, are capable of living lives very similar to our own. So remember Peter Zion made a comment that uh, those who refuse to get vaccinated for COVID, that, that uh, scammers in Africa and, and Russia are just targeting these people. But you, 
refusing to get vaccinated is largely a symbolic belief. You're identifying with a group of people who deny what the public health and the medical establishment is telling you is true, but I don't think you are then going to be dramatically more likely to be scammed, right? You still hold down a job, you run your own business. You might even be a doctor or a lawyer, or an accountant, a dentist, right? You're still in all likelihood a full functioning member of society, even though you hold what I, I think is a wrong belief. And so there are all these books out and all this public attention paid to the great problem of misinformation. It's not really a huge problem because of a point that I have made repeatedly over the years. We did not evolve to be gullible. And I got that from Hugo Mercier's book, Not Born Yesterday. So he's a neuroscientist. And he made the point we did not evolve to be gullible. We evolved methods of detecting when other people are trying to manipulate us. Right? We tend to be really good at figuring out when other people are trying to manipulate us and how we can protect ourselves from that. So we tend to be really bad at figuring out when we are trying to fool ourselves. And with a lot of our symbolic beliefs, often with regard to, say, religious beliefs, we're trying to fool ourselves into believing something that's just going to make our life easier by staying in alignment with the way we were raised, uh, staying in alignment with the uh, people we went to school with, by staying in alignment with our community, by staying aligned with a type of identity that signals to your fellow Americans that you're a good and reliable person. Because even atheist Americans and secular Americans believe that religious people are more ethical and more reliable than non-religious people. So in America, being associated with religion is primarily a way of saying, I'm a good person, I'm reliable, I'm an upstanding member of society. Without regard to the fervency or dedication that you hold to these particular symbolic beliefs. So we often try to fool ourselves into believing things that uh, the rational empirical part of our brain thinks is false. And we will often believe in things that are talking points for say our political partisan side, when if we are offered rewards for detecting that which is true from that which is false, we'll, we'll often give up many of our conspiracy beliefs of a, of a partisan nature, right? We'll, we'll, we'll trade them in if there's, if there's money in it, because we recognize the, the purely symbolic, the purely signaling nature of many of our political, social, religious, and cultural commitments, right? Many of our symbolic beliefs are just primarily about belonging to a team, to a group, and to signaling to others that we're good people. But think about all the news media attention that was showered on the problem of misinformation or say Russian interference in the 2016 American presidential campaign. Now, Russia interfered with our 2016 presidential campaign just as the United States has interfered with dozens of uh, political campaigns in other countries. But the Russian interference was not decisive. And there's absolutely no evidence that it was decisive. It was very minor in importance, but it was blown up to be a huge deal because it was a way of solving the anxiety that opponents of Donald Trump felt when he became president of the United States. Like, how could this happen? It was considered unthinkable. And so the idea that uh, the 2016 election was hacked right, by, by the Russians and blaming the, the Trump victory on the Russians, right, that was a way to offload your anxiety. We all want to you know, offload our anxiety. So if I'm called out for a mistake at work, if I can blame my mistake on somebody else, right? I can get rid of the anxiety that I feel by blaming someone else. So I'll never forget one Saturday morning when my dad was sick, he was running late, he was due to deliver the sermon and 
I was standing on the driveway waiting for him to back the car out of its parking space. And my father went about backing his car out of the parking space by holding his driver's door open. And then instead of sticking his head out the window and looking to his left, he just held the driver's door open and then charged out of the parking space and pranged the door, all right, damaged it and pranged it against the, the garage. And then after he did that, he like said, it's your fault because you made me late. And it wasn't my fault, but the anxiety that he felt for doing something incredibly stupid Right. He had to offload that anxiety and to blame it on me. So if I get caught out socially uh, for you know, doing something stupid and I can, I, I feel all this anxiety building up for, for the humiliation that I, I'm feeling, if I can just like offload the anxiety and blame it on someone else, right, I'm gonna be highly tempted to do that. Hey, Mr. Judas, what up, bro? So, this channel, these live streams, this podcast, my, my website, I, it is leagues ahead of the New York Times and the mainstream media when it comes to perspective, right? For years, I've been talking about misinformation is not a major problem, right? Because we did not evolve to be gullible, right? That's, I talked about how uh, the, the case that Russian interference determined the 2016 election, that there was no substance to it. It was a, it was a liberal cope. It was a coping mechanism for people in the mainstream media who repeatedly assured their viewers and readers that there was no way that Donald Trump was going to win an election. And then when Trump won election, they felt great anxiety because they appeared like fools and buffoons and idiots and people who'd been lying and misleading the, the public and complete, they looked out of touch with reality. And so they couldn't handle feeling so out of touch with reality. So briefly, there were some mea culpas, including from the New York Times, that they hadn't done a good job uh, representing the, the side that, side of Donald Trump, the Republicans, that you know, the New York Times was an elitist, liberal, out of touch institution. And they acknowledged that immediately after the election, but then they quickly went along to blaming Trump's victory on things like misinformation and Russian interference. And the Russian Trump collusion story was the number one news story in the United States for about three years, and it was bogus. And then George Floyd died, apparently the hands of a police officer, and that, that kicked off the summer of George Floyd in 2020 in massive riots. And this anti-Trump racial hysteria was built on you know, a bogus reading of uh, statistics regarding the way that police treat African Americans. Police treat African Americans just the same way that they treat other groups. They, if they have more interactions with a particular group, it's because in, in some areas of life, you know, that certain members of that group commit proportionally higher uh, rates of offenses than other members of the group and other groups. So when there are segments of African-American uh, community, particularly some uh, young black men who commit disproportionate number of certain crimes, right, they're going to have disproportionate interactions with police. But overall, police are not out there, you know, lynching and killing young black men. It was just uh, pointless hysteria ginned up to get rid of Donald Trump and to make the case for some revolutionary change in the country. So after the Russia collusion hoax didn't work out, then the New York Times deliberately sought to inflate the importance of George Floyd's death and to initiate a racial reckoning that led to a massive increase in the number of murders and massive increase in the number of pedestrian deaths and driver deaths as police backed off from enforcing the law. And so some segments of society started driving more recklessly, living more recklessly. And as a result, you had a massive increase in the number of uh, black fatalities due to 
exuberant driving and due to a massive increase in the number of murders we had a massive up, uptick in a lot of different crimes uh, then that filtered into massive increase in uh, pedestrian and driver deaths among Latinos as well uh, not not much of a difference among Caucasians and Asians but you know, this channel I we, we nailed that right? we, we saw the, that hysteria for the for the fake news that it was uh, the recognition that different different people have different gifts right I studied economics and in economics we tend to treat you know all workers as just one form of input into a production cycle but Japanese Americans have different gifts from Nigerian Americans speaking of Nigerians people from the Igbo tribe are disproportionately successful compared to other tribes in Nigeria right West Africans and East Africans tend to have different gifts the West Africans dominate sprinting events and uh, East Africans dominate distance running right? the Japanese the Chinese and the Koreans they they have somewhat different gifts and then when compared to Europeans or Africans right they have statistically verifiable different gifts so just understanding that different people have different gifts is a huge aid for for understanding what's going on around us but so much of what's in the news is pointless right there's just a ton of hysteria and a ton of hype you know, trying to capture eyeballs and readers by dishing out things that are so sensationalized that they're effectively not true and lacking in importance uh, the idea that the United States needs to arm and support Ukraine is a dominant feature in the news media but there's absolutely no connection between what's going on in Ukraine and American vital strategic interests there's no inherent reason why Israel's invasion of Gaza needs to have any impact on American vital strategic interests none but the way the news media covers things you would think that the events in Gaza or the events of Iran sending drones slow moving drones to attack Israel on Saturday were of earth-shattering significance but the only reason that the Middle East is tremendously significant to the United States to the extent that that's true is because we're vastly overextended there just like we're vastly overextended into Europe right, just on the basis of national self-interest we should you know, probably pull out of NATO and uh, stop arming and aiding Ukraine we recognize that uh, Russia and China the other two great powers have their own versions of the Monroe Doctrine where they're not going to welcome you know, outside interference into their areas of influence uh, another way that uh, the news media consistently misses reality is by hyping the importance of individuals right? Bibi Netanyahu's personality his belief that it's his mission to save the Jewish people right? it really doesn't matter that much right? it's compelling human drama but when you read the news it's all about personalities right? when you can focus news stories around compelling personalities right you're highly likely to attract eyeballs right you're going to get viewers and readers and listeners when you talk about personalities but I'm a structuralist it's the structure the situations that's almost always far more important than the nature of personalities Israel's relationship with the Palestinians would not differ that much depending on whether it was the Israeli Labour Party or Likud who's in power Right, if Bibi Netanyahu dropped dead today, right, Israel's foreign policy would be pretty similar. Right? It's the structure of Israel's relationship with its neighbors that primarily determines how Israel operates. It's not personalities. Right? It's the structure of America's economy, military might, and relationships with other competing powers that primarily determines how American politics goes it's not Donald Trump's personality like Donald Trump's personality may be compelling or interesting or horrifying depending on your perspective but it doesn't really have that much to do with the real world
right? The real world is primarily dominated and operated on the basis of structure. What gift do the Australians have? Right, well, Australians love their idiosyncrasies, like anything that's, uh, you know, fair dinkum, like true blue, genuine Aussie, uh, eccentricities like uh, koala bears and Vegemite and Aussie slang. Right, Aussies love their idiosyncrasies. Aussies love the high quality of their life. Aussies love that their nation is probably the best place in the world to be an average bloke. The most famous book about Australian politics, perhaps the most important book about Australian politics is called The Lucky Country. So Australia is quote unquote lucky because of the capable nature of the people who settled and developed the land and then its natural setting being protected by an ocean so it does not have to erect walls against invaders it just has to uh, maintain a navy and to protect its shores and so Australia for years has a very firm immigration policy that if you come to Australia illegally you will not be allowed to stay right so Australia at various times has had influxes of boat people and when this was thought to be in the national interest, right? Thousands of, say, Vietnamese boat people were accepted as, as citizens of Australia and they became about 1% of the population at one point. But overall, Australia has maintained fairly strict uh, immigration control. And so not many people come to Australia legally and get to stay there. So because Australians have maintained strict immigration control, they're able to maintain good wages good standards of living for almost all their citizens, right? You can have either open borders or a welfare state, but if you have both, right, one is going to suffer very quickly at the hands of the other, right? American uh, wages for low-skill work is essentially unchanged since 1960, right? Construction wages, r real wages in Southern California are essentially the same as they were in 1960, because we have so much immigration. So Australians are proud of the high quality of life that they have developed. But yeah, the, the focus on personalities is one of the ways that the news media diminishes our understanding of reality. Right? The personality of Bibi Netanyahu is just not that important for, for predicting how Israel will operate. Now there was an American uh, political scientist who made a focus of, on presidential character. I think uh, Barber, Barber was his name, last name. I think he was at Duke University. And he rose to prominence in the 19th, late 60s, early 70s, because he predicted that uh, Richard Nixon was an active negative personality who would uh, be a disaster as president. And uh, and so I think Jim Barber, he came to prominence with this theory on presidential character. And then he predicted that Jimmy Carter would be a very successful president. And his theorizing was diminished by that and he lost status. So there have been academic approaches to try to quantify, qualify uh, the character of national leaders and to use it to uh, understand what happens and to make predictions, right? That's one of the most useful parts of a theory is does it, does it make useful predictions? But you don't really get many useful predictions on the basis of character. It's lucky because of all the Irish. Yeah, I got a famous Irish ancestor. His name escapes me. But he was a rebel. And I feel his blood coursing through my veins. And I visited his tomb at the Waverley Cemetery in Sydney. But the primary way we find out about the world around us is usually through following the mainstream news, right? CNN, CBS News, etc. But there are a certain basic tendencies in the mainstream media 
which are not helpful to our understanding of the wider world, right? TV news in particular relies upon action video. That which is sensational and grabs the attention of your eye is not usually important. You know, people who are significant are really famous and the famous are really significant. So a good podcast, right, a good blog, a good live stream can provide a much more profound and effective and useful and adaptive understanding of the world around us than the mainstream media. And I'm a big fan of the New York Times, right? I love the New York Times. It's my favorite source of, of news. I probably read more articles in the New York Times than, than any other publication. But there are ways that the perspective offered on this show is far, far superior to what's offered in the New York Times. For example, you'll get a lot more skepticism of institutions of the reigning conventional morality and of the professions like on my channel, on my blog, than you will in, in the New York Times. So the primary purpose of professions is to enhance their own money-making ability, their status, their prestige, and their power and influence over life, right? The, the way the medical profession, dental profession, accounting profession, legal profession, right? The way all the professions operate is not primarily in the public interest, but it's to enhance the interests of its members. And this is usually done at a cost to the public interest. Uh, there's, there's a you know, certain general liberal understanding of, of right and wrong, a liberal hero system that is the unspoken dominating moral principle in discourse, whether it's in the mainstream news media or from leading academics and politicians. And if you re read my blog or check out my live streams, you'll, you'll better understand this particular discourse, which presents itself as empirical and pragmatic and just interested in harm reduction and human flourishing. But you'll understand that it's just another partisan perspective on life. It takes the, the uh, liberal notion that we're primarily individuals born with certain inalienable rights. And this perspective on life is just much less helpful than the tribal and national perspective that we're primarily members of groups. Right? If you look at the world as primarily a bunch of individuals with certain inalienable rights, you'll think less clearly and you'll have less understanding of what's going on around you. And if you understand that people are primarily not individuals, but members of families, extended families, communities, groups, tribes, nations, religions. Right? We, we tend to think corporately. We think about Jews this way, gays this way, blacks this way, Australians this way, Japanese this way. Right? because that's an economizing device on our attention span. So there's a particular enlightenment, liberal worldview that believes in the Buffett identity, right? That we can rise above our circumstances and situation and that what goes on around us doesn't have to infect us, but that we can create our own meaning and purpose and morality. And this is the dominant ethos of contemporary discourse in the mainstream news media and of our elites. And it's a very different way of looking at war from the more traditional medieval perspective that we don't live buffered lives, that what's going on with you affects me, that what's going on in my neighbor's house affects me. That uh, the, the liberal ethos that dominates the mainstream media is that uh, we should all be reflexive. We should all be constantly monitoring our speech, thinking about how it will affect you know, different people who might hear it. And effectively, we're all expected to behave as courtiers now. So this is opposed to the people who thought of themselves as Lord of the Manor. So early Americans thought of themselves as, you know, and the English thought of themselves, my castle is my home, right? That's the Lord of the Manor morality where you get to speak freely because you're, you're the lord of your manor, your castle, your domain. And then economic, political, and military situations change so that the nobles increasingly had to shift to a centralized court 
in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. And so you had the rise of courtier morality where people were expected to adjust their every word, every gesture to what was going on with the national court at the time. Now in America, the liberal perspective is that we should be constantly adapting our language, our expressions on the basis of how will it have possibly affect, come across to a wide, wildly varying number of groups. While the more traditional, my home is my castle, traditional conservative, reactionary, medieval perspective is that my home is my castle and I can say what I think and I don't have to cuck, I don't have to bow, I don't have to scrape, I don't have to modify, I don't have to mollify others. I can just say what I think. Right, so we all have a hero system, right? We all fear insignificance, so we sign on to some kind of hero system to give our life the feel of eternity that we're part of something that will go on beyond us and we usually get our hero system from our community. And this is a much sharper, wiser way of understanding reality and simply accepting the unspoken hero system, which is by virtue of not being explicated and not being revealed as the, the partisan hero system that it is, it's simply presented in the mainstream media as you know, this is just the way it is. It's just the nature of reality rather than being a particular choice, a particular way of being in the world. So a more reflexive buffered identity where we get to choose and create our own meaning and morality as opposed to the more visceral traditional type of morality where we encountered a world filled with, with God and with demons and with angels. And so for the, for the trad, right, our greatest fear is moral contagion and invasion and anarchy while for the modern for the liberal for the person left of center the greatest fear is ignorance and bigotry right lack of education lack of sophistication lack of the ability to take on the the buffered reflexive sense of self lack of ability to adopt courtier morality